Just to refresh and recap a bit, why are we doing this? Well, because what lies ahead is a powerful series on what are considered to be the two most difficult books of the Bible to understand. Uh, Bible scholars abroad have agreed that Daniel and Revelation, being prophetic books, are very difficult to understand. All these images and beasts and dragons, uh, you know, who can make sense out of all this? Well, by God's grace, we're going to see that Daniel and Revelation are very, very much able to be understood. But before diving into God's Word, I felt it would be appropriate to make sure that what we're studying is worth studying. Because I, I'm not going to spend all this time studying the Word of God with you guys unless you're positive it is in fact the Word of God that we're studying. And I remember hearing certain questions from certain people that reminded me a lot of me when I started my spiritual journey. Doubts, questions. I mentioned, for example, thus far, that the Bible is not the only book, the only writing that is deemed or considered to be divinely inspired. <clears throat> I shared with you guys all kinds of famous names. Buddha, Mohammed, Confucius, Gandhi, Notre Dame. They all have written things that have been critically acclaimed as divinely inspired. Why would we put our faith in the Bible over any of these other books? A few other questions I asked. If there is only one God, if there even is a God out there, for those that doubt, if there's only one God and only one Bible, why so many different churches? Why so many different faiths? It's ludicrous to see that under the umbrella of Christianity, we have, according to the latest polls, over 45,000 different faiths. It doesn't make sense. Well, it starts to make sense when you begin to see how you can go, as I've mentioned, to pretty much any church, any denomination, any faith, walk right in and ask out loud, whoever is here, but can tell me why they're here, why they're in this church, in this denomination, putting their trust in this faith, worshiping on this day, in the method in which you're worshiping and can back it up with the Bible, stand up. And we would see that the vast majority of people, they wouldn't stand. Because remember, we covered, I think, most of them. People come to church for many reasons. Why do you come here? Oh, well, the choir sings beautiful. Why do you come here? Oh, man, the potluck is off the hood. Why do you come here? Oh, my wife has been here since she was a teenager. She loves it. Why do you come here? Oh, they have a nice little kidney program. All kinds of reasons except biblical ones. And what does the Bible say? 1 Peter 3.15, our scripture reading, that has been our scripture reading as we've been studying this. God says that He wants us to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks the reason of the hope that is in us. God wants us to know why we believe what we believe. Why we are where we are. That's why we're searching for what many don't even really care to look for. And that's truth. Because remember I asked the question, is the Bible truth simply because you believe it? Or do you believe in the Bible because you know it's truth? There's a difference. So this is what we're looking at now. Can we trust the Bible? I told you guys I was going to give you five reasons why we can trust and believe the Holy Bible to be the only inspired Word of God. I've already given you, I believe, four of the five. We went over its duration. The Bible being one of the oldest books in the world having received more persecution than any other book on the face of the earth. 
and yet it's still here. It's still here. And not only is it still here, every year is the best seller. Why? Because unlike the writings of Buddha, unlike the writings of Muhammad, unlike the writings of Confucius, unlike the writings of Gandhi, unlike the writings of Notre Dame, the Bible says this writing will stay here forever. Amen. Amen. So why? The Bible being one of the oldest books in the world, receiving more persecution than any book, why is it still here? Simple. Because God said it would be that way. I gave you guys number two. It's continuity. The fact that <coughs> the Bible took approximately 15 to 1600 years to be written by approximately 40 different authors that lived in different times, that all came from different walks of life. You've got the rich, the poor, the successful, the not so successful, slaves, doctors, kings, slaves, men, women, all kinds of people that God used to pen his sacred canon. And yet, knowing that the Bible covers literally every subject under the sun, you do not find a single contradiction. How is that possible? Because as God tells us in his word, there is only one true author, and that's God. I give you guys number three. The Bible's ability to tell the future. I gave you guys many examples of how things were said way before they happened. I showed you guys how according to history, there have been only how many worldwide kingdoms? Four. Four. And there was no fifth kingdom that took out the fourth. What happened to the fourth? It divided. And it divided into how many pieces? Ten. In ten. This is all history. That division is what we today know as Western Europe. But I showed you how the Bible said all of this would happen before it happened. And we are now in the middle of number four. The Bible's scientific brilliance long before man ever discovered it. <coughs> now, we covered last week part one of its scientific brilliance. Just to recap a bit, remember I shared with you guys last week, in 1520, the world was proven to be a spherical circle, round, when Ferdinand Magellan sailed around the world. However, the Bible said it, that it was round 2,220 years before that sail was made. In 1783, man made scientifically, I'm sorry, man made the scientific discovery that the sun moved, the movement of the sun, and how fast it travels at amazing speed. But the Bible said that the sun traveled 2,783 years before man discovered it. In 1946, the first photo of the earth was taken from space to prove that it actually floats in space and hangs on nothing. Interestingly enough, though, the Bible said that 3,246 years before that photo was taken. So, what do you think? Does the Bible tell the future? Is the Bible in sync with science? Last week we covered this phenomenon about creation versus evolution. I showed you guys what our brainiac friend here, Alan Booth, his theory. I told you I love how he's standing behind all these mathematical equations so that it really looks like he knows what he's talking about. Alan Booth said the following words of wisdom. The observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. In Hebrew, that is a dot. It's then tempting to go on a step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Wow. <coughs> you see, boys and girls, uh, billions and billions of years ago, and as I told you, this is, this is how they actually see the, the, the beginning. Billions and billions of years ago, nothing exploded. Has anybody here ever seen nothing explode? It's awesome. About 15 billion years later, 
the earth cooled down and developed a hard rocky crust. Uh, it rained over this crust and these rocks for billions and billions of years until it became a soup. And then billions of years later, that soup somehow came alive and out of it crawled out an amoeba. And this amoeba found someone to marry, apparently, found some stuff to eat, and millions and millions of years later, evolved into everything we see today. I defined a few terms for you, like the word stupid, <laughs> lacking normal intelligence or common sense, foolish, silly, a stupid idea. To think that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. As I said last week, I, I, I just can't believe how they actually cut down a tree to print this. And I mean, it came from nothing. Everything came from nothing. And they call this science and put it in a medical journal. Like I said, I think I'd call it a fairy tale and put it in the garbage. But anyways, I also gave you guys some unsolved mysteries that scientists and atheists and evolutionists cannot, cannot answer. For example, what exploded? Remember? I don't know. What caused the explosion? I don't know. Where did the energy come from that caused that explosion? Where did the matter come from? You know, all, all the dust and space that vacuumed into that little pot. Where did that amoeba come from? How are they going to explain the things that they have zero evidence for? I shared with you guys Dr. Lewis Trenchard Moore, Dean of Graduate School for Princeton University, when he said, the more one studies paleontology, which is the science of the beginning of things, the more certain one becomes that evolution is based on faith alone. Exactly the kind of faith which is necessary when one encounters the great mysteries of religion. We are asked to believe that something happened by chance that can never again be repeated, even under the most ideal laboratory conditions. And therefore, we are still in the realm of pure speculation. This is science talking, folks. Remember Darwin's bulldog? Dr. Thomas Huxley, what did he say? I beg you once more to please understand that I have no right to call my opinion anything but an act of philosophical faith. Evolution is unique among major scientific theories in that it's the, the appeal for its acceptance is based on not one shred of scientific evidence. It's amazing, he says, that we include evolution in the sciences when there isn't one, no, not one, particle of evidence to support it. Wow. This is why you guys have heard me say many times, and I can't believe I actually found the slogan for it, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I do not have enough faith to believe that nothing exploded. And in finishing recap, for those that missed it, you guys remember the conversation that I had with this supposed brainiac doctor who, <coughs> you know, actually specializes in studying the beginning of things, a paleontologist. And, and I told him, remember, uh, tell me more about this little infinitesimal dot of yours, what about that? And he said, well, you know, billions and billions of years ago, uh, all the dirt in the solar system uh, was drawn into this tiny little dot, and remember, it was spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning faster and faster and faster until boom, that's what actually exploded. Uh, and, you know, basically the parts that flew off uh, from the explosion became galaxies, and uh, here we are from the goo to the zoo to you. <coughs> and I asked him, okay, so <laughs> the little dot that was spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning exploded and what flew off, those are the things that became galaxies and here we are. Let me ask you a question, sir. Um, just out of curiosity, you said that 20 billion years ago, uh, all the dirt in the solar system got together, you know, for the big swish, the big bang, the big spin. Um, where did all that dirt come from? Uh, well, we, we, we don't really know that for sure. Ah, wait, 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 wait a minute, I said. You don't know where it came from. See, if I tell you 
that 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. You're going to tell me, oh, where did God come from? And since I can't answer that, I'm a moron, right? But you just told me that 20 billion years ago, all the dirt in the solar system was drawn in, sucked in, vacuumed into this little dot, but you can't tell me where the dirt comes from. So, so basically, I believe that in the beginning, God, and you believe that in the beginning, dirt. <laughs> Do not presume to tell me that my theory is religious and yours is scientific. No, 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 they're both religious. The news media likes to make it look like, oh, science versus uh, religion. No, it's not. They're both religious. So the professor, you know, couldn't tell me uh, where the dirt came from. Remember when I asked him, and by the way, uh, professor, can you tell me where all the laws come from? You know that the universe is uh, run by laws. You know, gravity, centrifugal force, inertia, Boyle's law, Boyle's law. Where did these laws come from? Uh, and by the way, why aren't the laws evolving? If everything is evolving, how come the laws are the same? Uh, and you guys remember that I finished by asking, uh, Professor, you know how a merry-go-round works, right? Of course I know how a merry-go-round works. Well, you do realize that if you, and I'm not going to go through the whole story I gave you guys last week, but for those that are here for the first time, just to catch the main points. If you get a whole bunch of kids and put them on a merry-go-round, and you start spinning, and spinning, and faster, and faster, and faster, eventually, those kids are going to fly off. <laughs> but you know what's interesting? That if you are spinning the merry-go-round clockwise, once the kids start flying off, they're going to spin going clockwise. This is called the conservation of angular momentum. This is science. It is virtually impossible for the merry-go-round to be spinning clockwise and the kid flies off spinning counterclockwise. Impossible. Because of the conservation of angular momentum. So here's where it got interesting. So, Professor, you say that that little dot was spinning and spinning and it just exploded, that it was the Big Bang and everything that flew off became galaxies, stars, and solar systems. Um, if this is the case, um, can you please answer me a question? Why do eight, I'm sorry, why do three of our eight planets spin backwards? He got real quiet. Why do eight out of our 91 known moons spin backwards? Why do Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune have moons orbiting in both directions at the same time? And by the way, why is the sun 98% hydrogen and helium, but yet other planets are less than 1% hydrogen and helium? Why are these eight planets so different from each other? If they all came from the same little spinning dot, and they all are part of this that just came out in the same place, shouldn't they all be the same? Why are they all different, made of different matter, with different hydrogen, different energy, spinning different ways? You couldn't tell me anything. I asked them, why is it that even some entire galaxies spin backwards? So, basically, folks, I'm hoping that you guys were able to see that by God's grace, it's not that difficult to debunk evolution. This whole nothing exploded. Yeah, something happened, but it appeared from nothing by nothing without a cause. We've been able to, by God's grace, debunk that. In essence, putting evolution and atheism aside. Here it is, in a nutshell. Atheism, the belief that there was nothing and nothing happened to nothing, and then nothing magically exploded for no reason. Creating everything, and then a bunch of everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits, which then turned into dinosaurs. Makes perfect sense. 
Remember what I shared with you guys? Even scientists themselves say, if an idea is not testable, repeatable, and observable, it is not considered science. True science must be observable, testable, and repeatable. Brothers and sisters, was the Big Bang in any way, shape, or form observable, testable, or repeatable? No. No. Thank you. So much for that. You see, the fact of the matter is, though, this was not always a problem. When people put their faith in this book, nobody wondered where we came from, because we knew. It was not until, like I said last week, books like this started coming out, that all of a sudden questions like this started coming up. Well, I shared with you the three major religious worldviews, theism, pantheism, atheism. And we started getting into being able to prove the existence of a theistic God. And now, <clears throat> by God's grace, this is where we're going to continue. Last week, I gave you guys three great arguments to prove the existence of a theistic God. The first argument was a beginning. Okay? A cosmological argument. The word cosmological, coming from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe, the argument stated that there had to be a beginning, and if the universe had a beginning, it must have a beginner. The second argument I gave was, uh, for, intel for intel uh, intelligent design, was the design itself. The teleological argument, tele meaning design or purpose, says that if there is a design in the universe, there must be a designer. And third argument, as I mentioned, morality. The moral argument, which says that if there's even one thing out there that's morally wrong, like, you know, wanting to torture babies for fun, or murdering six million people in the Holocaust, if there's anything out there that is in any way wrong, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity, then good and evil, as you and I know, it ceases to exist. Now it's just your opinion versus my opinion. It's my opinion versus the baby torturer's opinion. My opinion versus Hitler's opinion. <clears throat> so therefore, there must be a source, a point of reference outside of humanity which establishes it being morally wrong. This is why people feel, and I've always, you, you want to stump an atheist? Ask them, where does guilt come from? Did guilt evolve? Was guilt part of the Big Bang? Was a heavy conscience part of the Big Bang? Ha, explain that. They can't do it. Well, last week we looked at the beginning of things in which we were able to, by God's grace, debunk evolution. Now we're going to look at the design. Which brings us to the scientific brilliance of the Bible, long before man discovered it, part two. And I don't know how we're gonna do this in the time we got left, but I'm gonna go at a million miles an hour. The fine tuning of the universe. Talking about design, folks. The universe is highly fine-tuned. If even the smallest minute detail or factor within the universe was to be slightly changed, we would vaporize instantly and cease to exist. The universe did not explode into being out of nothing like a random explosion. The universe exploded into being with perfect extreme hairline precision. Even one of, the great, one of the most famous atheists, Stephen Hawking, said the following. This is an atheist talking, but he said, if the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million, it would have collapsed before it reached its present size. 
On the other hand, if it would have been greater by the same exact amount, by the exact same amount, the universe would have expanded too rapidly for the stars and planets to form. So even atheists are saying, what happened had to have happened exactly the way it did for us to survive. What about gravitational force? Did you guys know if the gravitational force in the universe was altered more than one part in 10 to the 40th power, the sun would not exist and neither would we. Now that's one part in 10 to the 40th. Now you're probably asking, what, what does that mean? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to wrap your mind around a number like that. Uh, if that's one part in one with 40 zeros after it. Okay? Let me illustrate. If you were to take a tape measure and stretch it across the entire known universe, now I realize that gravity is not measured in inches, okay? But just to give you a, a scale idea. If you were to take a tape measure and stretch it across the entire universe and then set the gravitational force at a particular inch mark on that tape measure, if you were to move the strength of gravity one inch to the left, one inch to the right, in either direction, we would cease to exist. Now that's one in 10 to the 40th precision. Now there's only three possible explanations for something like that, for the gravitational force value to be what it is. One, physical necessity. It had to be there. No, it didn't. It could have been a trillion miles that way, it could have been a trillion miles that way, it could have been here, 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 it doesn't matter. Well, number two, chance. Dumb luck. Like I said, I don't have the faith to believe that that just happened by chance. In fact, what does the word chance even mean? Is, is, is chance a cause? Is there a possible force out there known as chance? When scientists say, you know, well, you know, in estimating, uh, uh, the chance is, is, is there like a, a cause out there? You know, who caused this? Chance! Oh, chance, there he is. Go get him. No. Chance. You know what chance means? Chance is simply a word used to describe the mathematical possibilities when we don't know what the cause is. And that's what's used many times. Now, the third possibility is intelligent design. Amen. Somebody designed it to be right there, right where it is. And I don't know, that seems to me like the most logical explanation. That whoever created the universe and the gravitational force that sustains it, put it right there for a reason. One can also present the argument at the solar system level. Here is our solar system. Where are we in the solar system? The levels you are here. There we are, Earth, third rock from the sun. You do realize that if we were just a little bit closer or a little bit farther to the sun, we wouldn't be here. A little bit further from the sun, we would instantly freeze. A little bit closer to the sun, we would burn to a crisp. The earth just coincidentally happened to be right smack dab in the perfect place to not freeze or burn. We are in what the scientists call the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. What about the axial tilt? The axial tilt is 23 and a half degrees. Well, 23.44 to be exact. Changing that slightly, we wouldn't be here. What about the Earth's rotation and revolution? The constant revolving of the Earth and its non-stop rotation, clocked on, precise, on a precise 24 hour period, change that slightly, we don't exist. Look at Earth's perfect hairline precision here. Earth, 
the only planet that can support life. You do realize that if we put human beings on any other planet in our solar system, instant vaporization. We would not be able to survive. Man, lucky for us, we were all born on the right planet. Number two, the only planet which keeps temperatures at just the right level to support life. It's also the only planet known to produce oxygen at the level of 21%. If it were slightly higher, if it was 22%, spontaneous fires would break out immediately. If it was slightly lower, we'd all suffocate. If Jupiter, you guys know Jupiter, right? If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we would not be here. You know why? Just, I'm just curious, by show of hands, does anybody know why, if it was not for Jupiter, we would not be here? Exactly. Jupiter's gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space debris to it rather than us. You know, gravity is everything. You take something, it falls down. That's the gravity of the Earth. But the gravity of Jupiter is so strong that it sucks and vacuums any meteors or space debris that could be headed toward Earth. Let me show you something. Look at this close-up of Jupiter. Look at these four fragments. You know what these fragments are? These are comet fragment strikes, scars, that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. Amen. And Saturn does the same thing. You want to see a little bit more closely the size of Jupiter? Check this out. Well, you know what? Let's start with the Earth, our planet. Our planet is not a small planet. Can anybody, you know, ride their bike around this planet and figure out it? No, the Earth is ginormous in comparison to our size. Look, here's the Earth next to Venus, Mars, Mercury, Pluto. The Earth is the biggest one. But now watch this. So you can guys get an idea of the size of Jupiter. Look at where Earth is. Let me get my little laser here. Here's Earth. Here's Jupiter. You want to have an idea? Just for you to see. Did you know, and this has been scientifically way to measure, a thousand Earths could fit into Jupiter. A thousand Earths can fit into Jupiter. But now look at this. Look at the size of Jupiter compared to our sun. The size of our sun, and here's Jupiter. Did you know that it has been scientifically weighted and measured? 1,300, 1,300 Jupiters can fit in our sun. <clears throat> 1,300 Jupiters can fit into our sun. That's how big our sun is. But check this out. Now look at this. This is our sun compared to the star Arcturus. Take the lens a bit further back. You see Arcturus here? How big it is compared to our sun? Check this out. Where is Arcturus now? To the right of the white star Regal. Here's Arcturus. Here's the star Betelgeuse. Earth is one pixel in size. No, the sun, I'm sorry, is one pixel in size. Earth, you can't even see. The fact is, here's, here's Betelgeuse. If the Earth were the size of a golf ball, Beetlejuice here would be the size of six Empire State Buildings 
piled one on top of the other. Picture a golf ball next to six Empire State Buildings. That is the size of the earth compared to Beetlejuice. But now check this. Beetlejuice. And here, the largest known star. V.Y. Canis Majoris. V.Y. Canis Majoris. You want to take a, a little look at how big V.Y. Canis Majoris is? Seven quadrillion Earths can fit in V.Y. Canis Majoris. You know what quadrillion is? There's million, then there's billion, then there's trillion, then there's quadrillion. Seven quadrillion of our planet can fit inside VY's Canis Majoris. That's enough golf balls to cover the, ent the entire state of Texas 22 inches deep. Just picture the whole state of Texas full of golf balls, 22 inches deep. That's how many Earths can fit into the White Hands of Earth. And this is just in our galaxy. This is not the whole universe, this is just our galaxy. Well, here's a little surprise. I think even Daniel Mann might remember some of these pictures that I showed from way back. At that time, V.Y. Canis Majoris was the largest known star. But recently, in recent years, check this out. Look at where V.Y. Canis Majoris is. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce you to U.Y. Scooty. Look at the size of U.Y. Scooty in comparison to V.Y. Canis Majoris. This right here is V.Y. Canis Majoris. Look at our sun. Our sun. You guys remember how big our sun was? This is our sun. Here's Jupiter. Here's Earth, one pixel. Look, excuse me. This is our sun. This is our sun. These are, this is our solar system. Here's Earth, right here. This is Earth. This is how tiny Earth is compared to our sun, yet, this is our sun compared to UI Scooby. Nearly a thousand Earths can fit into Jupiter. 1,300 Jupiters can fit into the sun. Our sun, UI Scooby, nearly 5.1 billion of our suns could fit inside UI Scooby, the largest known star. No, my friend, you are not the center of the universe. Contrary to what some of us might think. Here's a few more fun scientific facts about our universe. Did you guys know that the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 25 to 30 trillion miles? You know how far that is? That's far, okay? 25 to 30 trillion miles between one star and the next. And by the way, that distance is needed for the Earth to exist in its safe and stable orbit here. How long would it take to travel 25 to 30 trillion miles? Okay. Has anybody here ever heard of the space shuttle, the Atlantis? You guys heard of the Atlantis? Check this out. The space shuttle Atlantis launches with both the main engines and solid rocket boosters operating simultaneously. The shuttle travels at a speed of almost 18,000 miles per hour. That's five miles a second. 5, 10, 50, 20, 25, 30, already 30 miles to travel in just the time that I count. By the way, so you have an idea of what we're talking about here? 
The fastest commercial airline known today is the Boeing 747. You know, the, the planes that you take to fly to, you know, to China or to India or to all over the world. The planes that you take. The fastest commercial airlines right now, 659.85 miles per hour. 650 miles an hour, give or take. Oh. The fastest planes that we see, 650 miles an hour. This shuttle travels 18,000 miles an hour. That's nine times faster than the fastest bullet. <laughs> and you got any trouble getting to work on time? Take the shuttle! You'll be the light on there. If I would have traveled to church this morning at the speed of light, I would have gotten here yesterday. I did a little calculation. Check this out. If we got into that space shuttle, the Atlantis, which travels at 18,000 miles an hour, if we got into that space shuttle, how long do you think it would take us to go from our star, the sun, and travel to the next star over, our neighboring star? In other words, how long would it take to travel 30 trillion miles at 18,000 miles an hour. Five miles a second. Anybody want to take a guess? I did the calculations. Are you ready? To travel 30 trillion miles at 18,000 miles an hour from the sun to the very next star over, it would take 201,000 450 years. Do you know what that means? That means, check this out, you have to get this, to get the idea. This means that if you would have gotten into that space shuttle, the Atlantis, during the time of Christ, and left the sun and start heading to the next star, if you would have gotten into that space shuttle at the time of Christ, Right now, you would be almost 1% of the way there. Wow. <laughs> right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. We're not going to explore anything. It's way too big and way too big. Folks, at 18,000 miles per hour, it would take over 200,000 years to simply go from one star to the next. And yet, this is what our universe looks like. Just how many stars are there out there? The number of stars out there, you want to know how many stars there are out there? They're about equivalent to the amount of grains of sand in all the beaches of the earth. You know that if you take just a handful of sand, anybody want to guess how many grains of sand do you think are in there? One handful is over one million minerals. One handful. And yet, how many stars are out there? About equivalent to all the sand of all the beaches on Earth. History records that Hippocrates, perhaps one of the most renowned and respected scientists slash astronomers during the time of Jeremiah, when the book of Jeremiah was written, Hippocrates was convinced and taught that there were only, are you ready for this? 5,119 stars in existence. Today, approximately 2,640 years after Jeremiah was written, we know that the Milky Way alone contains over 40 billion stars. 
and that the mirage of other galaxies are even bigger than the Milky Way. Today, science has accepted, as a matter of fact, the stars simply cannot be numbered. This is why Psalms 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. Amen. And this is why you cannot refute that there was intelligent design behind this. Now, time is pretty much gone, but I do want to keep my promise. I do want to keep my promise. Do you guys remember that last week I told you that even though we have been able to debunk evolution and that that big bang, but do you guys remember that I told you there was another bang. There was an actual explosion for which there is scientific evidence for. The Big Bang, we know that didn't happen. But now, I want to introduce you guys to something that you've probably never heard of. I'd like to know by show of hands, how many here have heard of the Cambrian explosion. Without counting having heard it in this church or... <laughs> okay. The Cambrian explosion. You know what that is? Check this out. This is science. The Cambrian explosion. Pay close attention because if you miss one word, you're going to miss it. The Cambrian explosion is the genealogical sudden and abrupt appearance of most of the major groups of animals that have ever existed on Earth. This is a dramatic event in the history of life because it documents on fossil record the appearance of all the major complex species and phyla animals to have come into existence all at about the same Scientists are perplexed by this. They say, from nothing, we have almost everything, practically overnight. The explosion is real because the fossils are real. Explaining it, however, is controversial. This phenomenon remains mysterious. Nobody really understands how this happened. You see, folks, the explosion that almost nobody has heard of. Everyone's heard of the Big Bang. But this explosion of life, known as the Cambrian explosion, almost no one has heard of. Now, you know who had a real problem with the Cambrian explosion? You got it. Charles Darwin. Darwin's biggest nightmare was an unexplainable major event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion. <laughs> Dr. Jonathan Wells says the following, Darwin knew about the Cambrian fossil record. He considered it a serious problem for his theory. He hoped that the future fossil collecting would fill in the gaps somewhat and make his theory more plausible. But the fact is that 150 years of continued fossil collecting has only made the problem worse. Many more type of animals have been discovered to have evolved overnight that Darwin ever knew, that never knew about. It's actually more of an explosion now than Darwin ever thought. You see, Darwin could find no evidence for fossils prior to the Cambrian explosion. Hmm, I wonder why. The mystery has continued to perplex paleontologists to this day. You see, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Darwin's tree of life, but according to Darwin, he says we all came from the amoeba, the one-celled amoeba. See, down here, we all started 
from one little thing and then through millions and millions of years it started expanding expanding and evolving and evolving and little by little the tree started growing this is Darwin's theory what Darwin's theory rests upon it all came from a one cell of evil and through millions and millions and billions of years the tree began to grow but here's the problem that according to actual scientific studies and what they have actually discovered and found on fossil record the evidence turns his tree upside down. The Cambrian explosion takes Darwin's tree of life and turns it upside down because the Cambrian explosion proves there's fossils and, record, uh, and bones and phyla all over that just happened to appear almost overnight. Before that, there's no fossils ever and it's been getting smaller and smaller as animals have been dying off and becoming extinct. You see, Darwin was sure that as long as we keep digging and keep digging, we're going to find fossils that prove that there were evolvements. We're going to find half bird, half man. We're going to find half fish, half crab. But he never found one. And what totally stumped Darwin is when he kept digging and kept digging and kept digging along with the other paleontologists until they finally came to the final layer known as the Cambrian Explosion where mysteriously no scientist, no biologist, no paleontologist can explain how all of a sudden we've got fossils of phyla everywhere and like they all appeared at once overnight. And then under that we keep digging and digging and there's nothing. Why do you think that's been silenced? Why do you think you've never heard about this? No, I don't think this country would hide anything from me. <laughs> Folks, most science and biology textbooks supply very little information about the Cambrian explosion, if they even mention it at all. Please do your own research on the Cambrian Explosion. According to most biology textbooks, fossils that show the gradual development of life from simple to complex over hundreds of millions of years, if not billions of years, but a growing number of scientists, archaeologists, and paleontologists are concluding more and more that these textbook stories are incomplete and even misleading because they are practically ignoring an extraordinary event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion. By the way, regarding the origin of life, okay, uh, I hope this works. Danny, where's Danny? Um, what about for sound? Did we not prepare for this? Oops. Is that something that... Oh. Okay. Give us one second. It's all right. I want to share with you guys a brief...
But a growing number of scientists say that this textbook story is incomplete and even misleading because it ignores an extraordinary event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion. The Cambrian Explosion is a term that refers to the geologically sudden appearance of all the major, or most of the major groups of animals uh, at about the same time, geologically speaking. Most geologists date the Cambrian Explosion at 530 to 520 million years ago. The Cambrian Explosion is uh, a name given to a geologic event, really, the appearance in the fossil record over a period of about 10 million years or slightly less of a skeletonized fauna that includes um, many living fauna for the first time. Animals with similar body plans are grouped together to form various phyla. Indeed, if you look at the tree of life, you can infer that nearly or all living phyla had evolved by the end of the explosion period. The Cambrian explosion has been called life's big bang, or at least animal's big bang, because uh, in the Cambrian explosion, most of the major forms of animals appeared very suddenly in a geological sense. From nothing, we have almost everything, almost overnight, geologically speaking. This remains mysterious. Nobody really understands how this happened. Explosion is real in the sense that the fossils are real. There they are. Explaining it, however, is it's controversial. We're not sure uh, just how far back the animals originated before the explosion or what the events were that led up to it. In Darwin's theory, if you think of the branching tree. Darwin's branching tree, the common ancestor down here, and the different modern forms of animals up here, you would have one form to begin with, and then it would gradually diverge into slightly different forms, and more and more different, until you get the major differences that we see now. The problem with the Cambrian explosion is that all these major differences appear together at the same time, with no fossil evidence that they descended from this common ancestor. you have a sudden emergence of new biological form and structure. And the suddenness of it defies the Darwinian mechanism's ability to produce new structure. Darwin believed that his mechanism must act slowly through small, gradual, incremental changes. And as a result, he expected to find many transitional, intermediate forms from the very simplest organisms to the first animals. Darwin knew about the Cambrian fossil record and he considered, considered it a, a serious problem for his theory. He hoped that future fossil collecting would fill in the gaps somewhat and uh, make the theory more plausible. But in fact, 150 years of continued fossil collecting have made the problem worse. Many more types of animals were involved than Darwin knew about. So it's actually more of an explosion now than Darwin thought it was. Most biology textbooks, however, supply little information about the Cambrian explosion, if they even mention it at all. My textbook gives a one sentence statement, just that there was this Cambrian explosion of life. But then it goes on to give a traditional Darwinian theory as to this slow, gradual evolving process. De Hart wanted to supplement the solitary sentence in the biology textbook with an article that appeared in the Boston Globe. The article reported on cutting-edge research by Chinese scientist J.Y. Chen, an internationally respected paleontologist at the Nanjing Institute of Paleontology and Geology. Chen's discoveries in the fossil beds in Xinjiang, China, have rocked the scientific establishment. He found many fossils of the Cambrian Flow. 
tiny bit of gold. Located in the province of Yunnan in southern China, Xinjiang is some of the world's best preserved fossils from the Cambrian era. Darwinism helps them maybe only telling a part story for evolution. According to Chen, the fossils he's discovered turn Darwin's tree of life upside down. Darwin is a tree, a uh, reverse country, very unexpectedly. Our research is convincing a uh, major file of starting down below at the beginning of Henry. Base is white, gradually narrow. So this is almost a turn down different way. Uh, I do not believe that animals develop gradually from the bottom up. I think the animals suddenly appeared. Among the Qingjiang animals, we have found 136 different kinds of animals. And they represent diversity in the level of phyla and classes. So the sudden appearance makes them very special. I don't know how much you were able to hear from the video. Were you able to hear it relatively okay? Yes. Did you hear the professors in school saying, our textbook have like one sentence just stating, yeah, there was a Cambrian explosion. But then they go right back to the traditional Darwinian teachings. Folks, the Cambrian explosion is real because the fossils are real. But why is the scientific world trying to keep a lid on the Cambrian explosion? Why is it that everyone knows what the Big Bang is and almost no one knows what the Cambrian explosion is? That's not coincidence, folks. This is the enemy's plan to try to get a creator out of the way. This is Satan's plan to try to dissolve God. You see, this is what they were saying that Darwin's problem was. When it came to evolution, Darwin was like, okay, we have all the proof that this guy exists. We've got all the proof that this guy exists. Darwin was sure that in his findings with his archaeologists and paleontologists, uh, paleontologists with the digging and research that they were going to find bones and phyla of these guys in between. But not one, to this day, not one bone has been found in any of these guys to prove that any of these ever existed. Can we close the door? Don't get me wrong, I love my dad, but this is not the time to put it. All right. Look, microevolution, microevolution is what there's evidence for. Exactly. You know what microevolution is? Microevolution says that you can have a small lizard, a, a small lizard, a big lizard, a green lizard, a yellow lizard, but they're all lizards. Macroevolution teaches that, well, you started off as a lizard, but through millions and millions and millions and millions of years, all of a sudden you started sprouting feathers, you started sprouting claws, and uh, you became a bird. But what's interesting is, again, all kinds of fossil record evidence file up to prove that this guy exists, to prove that this guy exists, not one single shred of evidence to prove that any of the guys in the middle ever existed. I don't understand how science just doesn't, doesn't get it, doesn't like, duh, all the digging, all the research, and they find tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of evidence for guys like this, guys like this, not one single bone to any of these guys, but no, no, we just gotta keep looking. And when the Cambrian explosion came, oh man, this does not help. Objection, Your Honor! Uh, why? Because the evidence is devastating to my case! Hearsay. Yes. 
Exactly. Look at this. And we're finishing. There are two or three million species on Earth. In spite of all the observations made by trained observers, not one change, in other words, evolution, from one species to another is on scientific record. You know who said this? Charles Darwin. Wow. Charles Darwin himself had to admit that with two to three million species here on Earth, with all the trained observers working around the clock, not one single change from one species to another is on scientific record, is on the fossil record. <clears throat> Question. Have you ever asked yourself why we, as a species, as human beings, are so advanced as a species above all other living systems on Earth? We are the only species who have the ability, unlike any other of the two to three million species on Earth, we are the only species that can think, can reason, can laugh, can cry, can love, can be creative. You know why we're the only species that can do that? Because Genesis 1, 26 said, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We were created in the image of God. So in closing, was there a big bang? Yes. God spoke. Bang. It happened. That's the big bang. That's the big bang for you, okay? This big bang? No. This big bang. The Cambrian explosion, which clearly gives irrefutable scientific evidence that there was indeed a moment in Earth's history where a vast number of multiple species all originated simultaneously at the same time. Scientists call it the Cambrian explosion. Shh, let's not tell anyone. We call it creation. So folks, praise God that, you know, just like the enemy tried to attack this morning, there, yeah, there's still some stuff missing, but I don't think the computer gave me any real problems. That's right. We were able to, were you guys able to follow? Yes. Understand? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Last week, we debunked evolution. I'd like to think by God's grace today, I proved creation. Amen. There is literal, tangible, rock-solid evidence, irrefutable evidence that creation happened. It's not about, oh, thank God, hermanito. No, there's proof. It's called the Cambrian Explosion. Thousands upon thousands of fossils on fossil record proving that there is a creator that said, let it be, and God saw that it was good. Amen. So by God's grace, am I helping you to believe that the Bible is in fact God's word? Amen. There's no other religious book that has this kind of information. No other religious book that tells the future the way the Bible does. No, beloved, the Bible is special. Next step, we're going to conclude the entire Proving the validity of the Bible. We've been doing it for four weeks. Next Sabbath is week five, our final close on proving the validity of the Bible. We're going to see even more because all I did was prove creation. But did you hear? Did you happen to hear the scientists saying, okay, fine, uh, we can't escape the Cambrian explosion. But did you hear that a lot of the scientists said uh, the Cambrian explosion, we believe, happened millions and millions of years ago? Yes. Did you guys hear that? Yes. So we still got a problem. Because I'm trying to prove to you the validity of the Bible as being God's word. I already proved to you that evolution is hogwash. 
I already proved to you that there was a creation. But now we got a little problem because the scientists, paleontologists, are saying, fine, fine, okay, the Cambrian explosion happened, but it happened millions and millions of years ago, unlike your Bible that says we've only been around about 6,000 years. You come next Sabbath. I'm going to put a finishing touch to this by God's grace. I'm going to not only finish debunking evolution, not only completely pulverize anything that goes against creation, but I'm going to prove to you with tangible scientific evidence that this earth and life on it could not possibly be billions and millions of years old. And I'm not just going to tell you, oh, just believe me, uh, you have faith. I'm going to prove to you with tangible evidence that life on this planet matches biblical time. Amen. So please do not miss next Sabbath. Bring friends, bring colleagues, bring co-workers, family, whoever you want to bring. We're bringing a shutdown to proving the Bible being the only solely inspired, inspired divine inspired word of God. After next Sabbath, we're going to have that special Sabbath that I told you I haven't given you much detail on. And after that special Sabbath, now that we know that the Bible is in fact God's word, now we're going to dive into it to see what gems God has for you and for me. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing our closing song.